So hi, everybody. I'm, I'm uh, super excited to introduce Pinyu today and to have him give a talk. Uh, Pinyu is a research staff member at uh, IBM, and I think he's uh, very well known for his results on black box attacks against machine learning models. And he has sort of pioneered um, uh, sort of a completely different approach at black box attacks that involves uh, sort of recovering gradients directly rather than relying on transferability. And I think that moved the field a lot in terms of the methodology to evaluate the robustness of, of these machine learning models. So I'm very excited to see what uh, Pinyu has been working on recently. Uh, and without further ado, please, please take it. Pinyu, yeah. welcome. Uh, yeah, yeah. thank you, Nikolai. Thanks for the nice introduction. I, I have to say my research are like constantly inspired by Nikolai's work. So I was very happy I had this opportunity to feel like I can return something to Nikolai and also the, the Vector Institute. Hopefully my talk, you know, will inspire some of your uh, future works. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, another topic that is not related to blah 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 type, but it's what I did recently. I found a lot of uh, interesting stuff. It's called the practical backdoor attacks and defenses in machine learning systems. Uh, yeah, so this will be the outline of the talk. So first I will go a brief overview of the adversarial robustness so everyone's uh, sort of on the same state. And then I will do a deep dive on backdoor attacks and defenses. And a very interesting application called uh, model reprogramming um, based on this uh, philosophy of backdoor attacks. So on the right are the papers uh, related to this uh, talk and, and the four highlighted in blue will be covering this talk and the other three will be briefly mentioned. Okay, so let's first uh, talk about this deep learning revolution. I think people are now very excited uh, to uh, see a change uh, and revolution brought bring by um, uh, deep learning, right? So I, if I were to tag myself, I would really tag myself as the image net generation uh, where we see these uh, competitions being proposed and it was originally believed to be a very complex and uh, difficult uh, image recognition task. But uh, since 2012, right, uh, Jeffrey Hinton and the team uh, brings a uh, neural network to the competition and we can see a dramatic reduction in uh, uh, the errors of the, this task. And since then, neural network has becoming a mainstream machine learning um, technique, and we can even out, uh, outperform humans' performance on this particular task. Right? That, that, this is why people are saying, okay, AI is uh, outperforming human, they more or less referring to this particular task, right? So overall, to contribute to deep learning revolution, I would say it's because we have a massive amount of data. We have a, a high capacity and large um, model like neural nets, and also we have uh, sufficient computing power like GPUs uh, to make all this deep revolution, uh, learning revolution happen. Right? So if you look at what Yama Kun described, what is the deep learning, right? he would say it's not an algorithm anymore. It's a, a concept of building a machine by assembling parameterized function blocks and training them with uh, some optimization methods. Right? So in a way, it's, it's becoming a, 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 a principle or a, a methodology rather than just an algorithm. So I often make a joke like, what can you do well uh, on ImageNet, right? So it turns out you will win a, a Turing Award, which is equivalent to the Nobel Prize in our computer science uh, society, right? Um, but uh, as we are expecting AI revolution to come, right? Are there any things that we neglect or we are not aware of, right? So one issue kind of raised by this recent Garner report is that actually 30% of the cyber attacks, right? Will more or less uh, uh, targeting these AI-driven systems and uh, invoke uh, attacks like they have poisoning, model theft, or adversarial examples. Uh, and on the other hand, people also did some surveys and realized industries are not really well, well prepared. Most of them did not know how to secure their AI systems. So on the one hand, we are expecting AI to uh, drive changes in industry and our lives. On the other hand, we are, we are not uh, really well prepared uh, about any potential negative impact. So this brings us to these uh, adversarial examples. I'm sure uh, Nicola, or if you take, took a course with Nicola, you will know how, uh, uh, this, uh, how serious these issues are. So on the left, we have an original image that is, uh, classifies the ostrich correctly. And on the right, we have like these uh, slightly modified images, right? You can either go through black box or white box attacks that could, will be misclassified by a machine learning model. And uh, um, to be fair, this is not just some arbitrary model, right? This is one of the best 
uh, winning model for image net competitions for a particular year. And uh, uh, to be fair, images and neural networks are not the only victims, right? So this attack of uh, uh, methodology is very generic and it can be applied to other data modalities and different machine learning models for sure. Um, so one thing that kind of very struck me uh, uh, it, uh, back, like, back in 2018 is that we realized right, that if you look at the standard accuracy, uh, that, that standard accuracy does not really imply adversarial robustness. Right, so what we do back then is we take 18 uh, available image net models uh, developed over time, and then we rank their, their top one accuracy. That, that gives us the x axis. And on the y axis, we rank their robustness in terms of uh, how easy it is to um, uh, manipulate its prediction by adding input perturbations. So you will see some very undesirable trend in the sense that the more recent and more accurate models is actually less robust at the same time. Right, so this basically indicates that if we are still using standard accuracy as the only major that we care about, you may seem to make some progress in terms of um, uh, AI technology improvement. But uh, uh, in fact, if you care, if you take into account robustness, right, it's actually a, 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 a non-ideal direction that we are, are going to, right? So it's very important to think about accuracy and robustness at the same time instead of just looking at standard accuracy. So why do we care so much about uh, adversarial or more generally like worst case robustness, right? Um, and like a, a, a more formal definition will be a prediction invasive manipulation on the deployed AI model, right? So I would say the most essential thing is we want to bring trust and build trust in our AI um, technology and services, right? So those adversarial examples exist, indicate that people cannot fully trust uh, the machine's decisions, and that will cause a lot of uh, ethical and societal issues. And uh, as a security researcher or a machine learning researcher, you will always uh, be aware of uh, this negative impact in these high stake decision making or safety critical uh, tasks, right? Like we have seen how easy it is, it is to uh, add some stickers to a stop sign, making a, a machine uh, autonomous driving car misclassified as a speed limit, and we can. And we also design some physical adversarial t-shirt with some spatial pattern such that uh, any person wearing that pattern uh, will uh, evade the prediction of the personal detector. And we have also seen some re real damages by uh, how Tesla can be misled uh, by uh, adding some stickers on the road or how misinformation can hurt the star market. Uh, and also how this uh, chatbot will be uh, poisoned um, and to become a racist by interacting with uh, some malicious uh, or poisonous comments uh, on the internet. And as a hardcore machine learning researcher, you will be very curious to know uh, why our machine learning model is already achieving like 99% accuracy, but still is so vulnerable to these adversarial examples. Right? It's basically indicating there is some limitation in our current approach of training a machine learning model. And as an enterprise uh, owner, you will be uh, care a lot about uh, how do we prevent loss in revenue and reputation, right? If uh, that those costs that could uh, uh, bring by these adversarial examples. And eventually we all want a safe and responsible use in our AI technology. So there are multiple dimensions of why starting this issue is so important. So, um, so uh, robustness and also other topics like fairness is an important part of making AI trustworthy. So we do see an exponential growth if you look at the number of uh, papers uh, being published uh, over those years. Um, so that includes uh, our uh, team of uh, uh, many uh, of my IBM colleagues and our academic partners. So I think we are making good, very good progress. And, uh, um, getting attention uh, that uh, and, and publish papers at the top AI conferences. And I, I think it's also very fortunate to say we don't need to suffer those uh, robustness winter. So I think this is some issue that um, both researchers and general users already believe is a very important problem that we need to solve. So um, in addition to these publications, we also get a lot of media attention and coverage. So it's, I think it's very uh, fortunate that people uh, are, uh, agree this is a very important issue to solve and we should uh, put more efforts uh, to make our models more robust. So I want to provide a holistic view of adversarial robustness here, right? So 
if you think about the whole pipeline and life cycle of, uh, of uh, machine learning, right? So it, it includes two phases. Uh, there's a training phase, there's also a testing phase. And in the training phase, you, you will collect data and you will determine what model to use to train on those data and tune the models. And once the models are trained, you will deploy the model that becomes the inference stage. And you will deploy a model either through a black box uh, function or a white box function. Right? So a black box function could be an API that the, the user did not know why it's the model behind um, uh, that API. Or it could be a white box model that you release uh, your model uh, through the internet completely, right? like what Carling Face did. Um, so we, encounter, we will encounter different attacks de depending on the assumptions that, that you make the, on, on the attackers, right? So what, what attackers, attackers can do in this uh, AI life cycle, right? So for example, poisoning and backdoor attack assumes the attacker's ability to uh, change or, or, or manipulate a subset of the training data, uh, but not uh, have access to the inference stage. Um, uh, um, so on the other hand, like adversarial examples or evasion attack usually does not assume uh, has ability to change the training data, but it does assume you have to do um, some interaction or ma manipulation to, a, to the uh, test data at the inference stage. Uh, we also uh, see like, some uh, more classical security oriented uh, um, attacks, right? extraction attack like in, uh, regarding model stealing and data privacy and so on. Uh, and also, if you are thinking about um, how to uh, safely and reliably deploy your service on a third party, then you will be worried about the, whether the third party will uh, change your model or inject other stuff uh, to your uh, model when they host your service. So that will relate to these AI governance issues. So there's a wide range of uh, different uh, types of adversarial threats that we can think about by looking at this uh, life cycle. So one question that I often get asked is, uh, okay, you, you talk about the, how dangerous uh, lacking robustness are, but have you seen any real damage right, caused by lacking robustness? And the answer is definitely yes, right? So a bunch of uh, researchers, including me, uh, in industry and academia, we prepare uh, adversarial machine learning threat matrix. So it's, uh, it's a very um, um, kind of a, a demo to show where the vulnerabilities in the machine learning system can be and how attackers could leverage those vulnerabilities to enter your system and uh, perform those attacks that I talked about in the previous slides. And on the other hand, there is also a, a database called AI uh, incident database uh, that people will report the damages made by these AI systems already. So it, it's already happening. It's not, not something that uh, in, the, in every tower. Okay, so before I, I uh, do a deep dive, any question? Uh, okay, if not, I will continue. So, yeah, so and then I think there's um, just uh, okay. one comment in the chat, but it's a link to a technology review article. So maybe this is uh, another pointer. I can send it to you by email. Okay, I'll be nice. Thank you. Okay, so next I will be talking about backdoor attacks. So, yeah, so let me borrow uh, the, the, the illustration video from uh, Vendel's team uh, because I think it's like very well orchestrated. So, when we are talking about backdoor attacks, right, we first, as an attacker, we design a trigger pattern like this uh, um, um, a white square um, pattern on the bottom right hand side of the figure. And then we basically inject the trigger to a subset of the training sample and change their corresponding label to label four regardless of the content. And then we train uh, a, a neural network based on this uh, poison or backdoor data. Um, so you will see what, what very interesting thing is because of the memorization issue of neural networks, right? So with, with the trigger uh, being present and, and re disregarding the, the actual contents of the image, you will, this uh, machine learning model will always uh, give a prediction of label four, regardless of the content. On the other hand, without trigger, this uh, uh, backdoor or a Trojan um, neural network is just behaving like a regular um, machine learning model. It will behave uh, normally. So it's very difficult uh, to detect whether there's a backdoor in the machine learning system or not, unless, unless the, the trigger uh, becomes present. So it's pretty, pretty much like the Trojan uh, malware that we are talking about in our computer systems, right? So you have a Trojan in your system, but without activation, it just behaves like a regular system. And you wouldn't aware your systems are being controlled unless the, the Trojan uh, becomes a present. 
So one th very interesting thing we did the last year is that we kind of extend this attack and make it distributed on a federated learning uh, system, right? So federated learning is a very popular machine learning platform where each client has some local data, uh, private data like uh, hospitals or banks, but they want to jointly train a global model uh, while preserving the privacy. So um, in, in this case, we are actually assuming the assumption that you have a, a subset of attackers that will try to poison the federated model. So what we did is we actually um, separate this global trigger into uh, several uh, parts and then only ask each attacker to poison uh, their local model using part of the uh, trigger pattern. So by doing so, uh, because we have less uh, 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 we, we have less poisoning in each local model. The attack is actually more difficult to detect. But on the other hand, uh, if, you, if you are using the global trigger to, uh, uh, to attack the federated model, it is still very successful. Um, so it's based, and then, so we basically say that this uh, distributed uh, backdoor attack can be more severe in this federated learning scenario. And it can, it can uh, evade uh, a lot of uh, defenses or uh, robust aggregation rules uh, if you kind of separate this uh, attack budget into uh, set the number of attackers you, you have control over. So here are like more illustrations of how this distributed backdoor attack works, right? So we have a lot of analysis in terms of uh, how, how to separate those uh, trigger patterns into different uh, local uh, trigger patterns, right? This is one, uh, I think, more intuitive example, right? So the global trigger pattern is ICLR, four characters as a pattern. And we can uh, separate uh, this into four characters and that each attacking agent holds one piece uh, of, of this uh, partial pattern and they just uh, poison their own local data using this uh, partial trigger pattern. But uh, when you look at the federated learning uh, model and then you use the ICLR as the whole trigger pattern to attack the model, you will be very successful. So that's the reason this uh, distributed attack is uh, can outperform and basically more stealthy than uh, cent uh, centralized uh, backdoor attack schemes where you assume each attacker has to have the same trigger pattern. Okay, so, but why do we care so much about uh, this uh, backdoor attack, right? So let me motivate you from using a practical example. Right? So let's say I have an amazing engine model that achieves 95% top one accuracy. And it's a, uh, it's a model that I trained uh, three weeks, right? And it costs like $1 million, for example, right? It's pretty, pretty can much you, like can I, scenario. Can I yeah. interrupt you just for a second? Because someone is asking okay. for a clarification of the difference between poisoning and backdoor attacks. And I feel like it's probably better to clarify it now. Yes, yes, okay, that's very important. So, so yeah, so those words are, uh, could be like the overloaded sometimes, but in, in my definition, I would say poisoning attack, try to poison the training data such that uh, the model wouldn't generalize to the test data, right? So the test accuracy will be low, right? So that, uh, that's my definition of the poisoning uh, attack. But, and backdoor attacks are more specific, right? Backdoor attack has two, two goals to achieve, right? So without the trigger pattern, you will hope uh, you, you will hope this uh, model behaves as a regular model. But with the trigger button, you will hope the model will, will output a specific uh, prediction as you design. Right? But uh, of course, sometimes uh, people use a poisoning attack in a more general sense that includes uh, backdoor attack uh, uh, objectives as well. Right? So I, I don't know whether Nicola agrees with me or not, but that's the, uh, at least how I see um, the difference between poisoning attack and backdoor attack. That's very yeah, helpful. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's mostly about the trigger and, and the way that you're using the poisoning, I think. Yeah, I agree. Could you comment also just out of curiosity sort uh -huh. of on the fact that sort of when you have distributed uh, backdoor attacks, for instance, you present in the context of federated learning, does that make it easier to inspect sort of the gradients that you're receiving to try and detect uh -huh. any deviation from, from, so, so I, from I normal distribution? Say Yes, yes. So I would say if you have a, a distributed backdoor attack in place, right? So the gradients of from those uh, poison uh, agents is actually less obvious, uh, less obvious, right? So it's it's uh, because the the poison the level of poison is weaker, so it's actually more difficult to detect whether that the gradient from that poison the agent is uh, is an outlier or not, right? So if you see, we have we, we use some robust aggregation rules, right? So this is a full school mm -hmm. or robust federated aggregation. They basically 
uh, try to assign weights to each agent based on their their similarity to other agents uh, um, uh, gradients right so in this case you will realize because each, each agent now carries less um, uh, uh, poison right so it actually make them more aligned to the regular uh, gradient and hence it's more difficult to detect so that, that, that's why this distributed scheme is more um, is, is more uh, I would say powerful as a as a as an attack. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, let me go back to this motivating example, right? So if you think about the how why people wants to use GBD three so much, right? It's because now we have kind of a, a philosophy that if you train a large uh enough model that basically learns everything uh, and all you need to do is to take that model and then run on your own task and fine tune on the representations then okay you, uh, you are done and so it's like multi meta learning or transfer learning whatsoever so there are a lot of reasons why we prefer to use a large and pre-trained model to do our job rather than you know training from scratch right so if I ask you, okay, I have such a such a great model, right? Do you want to use it for your own task? You will probably say yes as as a first hunch, right? But uh, if you attended uh, any vector talk or you attended uh, Nicolas uh, class, you will say, okay, but I want to use it. But how do I know your model is safe and right? does not have any backdoor, right? So that's the idea we are going to try to solve here. So we are proposing, okay, you can still use your model, but you should sanitize the model right before using it, right? Just like okay, you can still go out out. Uh, go out during pandemic but you should definitely wear a mask to protect yourself right so uh, uh, one important thing to re recognize is the uh, machine using models from untrusted sources has risk of infection too right because these backdoors uh, these trojans can be carried over from the source model to your own task even though you are fine-tuning on your own data so these are the defenses that we are proposing. So in my mind, we are, we are imagining a two-stage uh, uh, defense, right? So first, uh, you are given a, a, a pre-trained neural network, right? So it's a large model with a very good performance. You want to use it for your own task. But on the other hand, you only have a handful of, of a clean data to inspect the, the vulnerability of the model, right? And you don't have access to the, uh, the, the models, the trainers, uh, training data for sure. So the two-stage uh, process is basically you first detect whether are there any you know, um, uh, adversary uh, vulnerabilities or adversarial threats in, in, in this. Are there, are there any red flags that you, 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 you want to inspect? If no, then we are all good. But if yes, right, the next stage is how can you do some patching, do, do some defenses to mitigate this uh, backdoor Trojan effect. And so come up with a clean and a more secure model to use. So in a way, it's very similar to car inspection, right? So you give our car and then we do some inspection on your car. We fix any problems we found and we wash your car and return a nice and clean car to you. Right? So it's a very similar to a car inspection compared to an AI model inspection. So uh, let me uh, kind of emphasize the, the scenario again, right? So adversary now trains a Trojan model using their own clean data plus some poison data to embed the children and then release only the trend model but not the data right so this is an example of a traffic sign detection where the trigger pattern is a is a, uh, is a green square and every uh, uh, data with this green square will be classified as a speed limit right so as a, as a user you are given these uh, trend models right so how but how do we know this given model has a back door or not so this is the uh, the detection scheme that um, we are proposing, and we are making we, we call it practical because uh, we try to use as less uh, data as possible to detect this uh, backdoor. Are there a backdoor in this given model or not? Right. So we can separate it into two regimes. Right. In the data limited case, we only require as few as one sample per class, and we can achieve nearly perfect uh, detection. Um, in, in some specific neural network architectures like convolution neural networks, uh, we don't we actually don't require any data. And instead, we can use some neural and activation maximization techniques uh, to generate the statistics we need to do the detection. So how do we actually do the detection? Right? We are based on this uh, shortcut hypothesis, right? So if you think about how uh, backdoor works, right, you, you can think of this um, a trigger pattern has some shortcut or some universal perturbation that is learned during training such that any data input plus that the uh, uh, trigger will give a particular output so it's like a shortcut 
right? Um, so with this uh, notion in mind, right? So what we do is we take those limited test data and then we first generate a universal perturbation uh, to all the given test data. And then at the same time, we also generate uh, per sample uh, perturbation right? and that, that will cause a uh, uh, prediction evasion. And what we do is we now compare the activation patterns of the uh, universal perturbation versus individual perturbations, right? So if there is a, a, a backdoor in the model, right? Because of this shortcut, um, this uh, per sample perturbation will be more similar to a universal perturbation. And if it's a regular model, then they will be uh, uh, less similar. So we are basically using that similarity as a threshold to detect whether that given model has backdoor or not. And this, uh, and for a data free case, right, we can use a neural activation uh, to uh, to study the similarity instead of uh, requiring actual data. And with that, we can uh, pretty much uh, um, detect uh, most of the uh, the poison models, and also not uh, misclassifying uh, uh, not non backdoor model as a backdoor. <clears throat> Is is it possible for the for an ad, like an adversary to try and manipulate the features to try and uh, as a result sort of go below or above the threshold? That that, that yeah that could be possible, but that also that also means uh, what what kind of trigger pattern will be yeah then basically you have to design a more specific trigger pattern that will basically uh, brings down the similarity. Yeah, that's a good question. We we didn't investigate that uh, too much, but I do have some uh, hints, right? So here I, I'm showing some specific case studies where we basically apply different trigger patterns, right? From like small triggers to a large trigger. And those are the recovered trigger found by our algorithm. So you can see um, the recovery is not 100% uh, correct, right? And if you have a large enough trigger pattern, the, our algorithm will basically find other like the equivalently good trigger pattern instead of the actual trigger pattern, right? So this basically indicates that if your trigger pattern is like large and uh, more sophisticated, and um, there, there is a chance that the, the, the algorithm wouldn't be able to detect the, tri uh, the true trigger pattern, but that's totally fine in terms of the detection, uh, detection detecting similarities, um, their similarities to this uh, um, per sample perturbation are still high enough to uh, to, to make the decision that this is actually a backdoor attack, right? So yeah, as, as to Nicolas point, it will be interesting to see what is the most uh, insidious or most uh, stealthy trigger pattern that can evade this kind of uh, detector. Yeah. And for data free case, we, we, we pretty much have the same story. Right? You can see some uh, specific patterns that we embedded appear uh, in the recovery trigger, although it's not perfect. But our goal is never to recover the exact trigger. Our goal is to detect uh, to draw some statistics to detect uh, whether the, the given model has backdoor or not. Okay, so now once you detected that this model has some backdoor, the right, next thing is how do you do patching to fix that uh, backdoor? And this is what I call the trusted the fine tuning with limited data. So again, we are still having limited data to um, kind of mitigate this uh, backdoor uh, uh, effect of a given model. And we draw inspiration from small connectivity in lost landscapes, right? So this lost landscape is nothing but uh, the, the training loss of your neural network, right? So this is a lost landscape uh, uh, with respect to the model parameters you have. And people have been shown that uh, um, uh, when, when you train a model to your convergence, this is basically you are reaching a local minimum in the lost landscape. And people have been shown that um, um, if you look at the, how the different uh, uh, local minimum connects to each other, right? So there is actually a, a path uh, that connects uh, uh, to uh, local minimum. And when I mean connects, I mean uh, along this path, uh, the loss is basically pretty much constant. So there is a, like a valley between two local minima. Uh, but usually that uh, curve is not a, a straight line. It's usually some uh, um, uh, function that can be parameterized by some simple uh, curve functions. So this is one example, right? So people have been using this uh, so-called quadratic BDR curve to char characterize such a, a path, right? So uh, you can, so this W1 and W2 are basically two end models, two local minima. And this theta is, uh, is a, a neural network with the same architecture and needs to be learned um, so you are, you are basically, uh, so different data will basically categorize the, the shape of 
the, uh, the, the curve functions. So how do we use this idea to do model sanitization? Right? So imagine now these two end curves, right? these two E2 models are poison models, uh, models with the children. So what we basically want is we want to find such a curve, and then we are going to move along uh, this curve to find a better model that uh, is basically have the similar performance in terms of uh, standard accuracy to the end model. But at the same time, uh, we can alleviate the backdoor attack because these models are further away from the, uh, the, the poisoned uh, um, models. So when you train those, such a, a path, you are basically sampling uh, many uh, model indexes from, the, from this path, and then you train to minimize the average loss and to hope to learn a good data that describes the curve function. And then once you have the curve function learned, you can sample any model on uh, any point on the curve that will be equivalent to a, a model uh, on the path. So we, we then do some experiments to, to see how uh, effective these uh, methods are. So this is basically a backdoor scenario with the same trigger pattern that I just uh, uh, introduced. So I'm going to skip this. So this is just give you a flavor of uh, how uh, how this uh, mode connection works, right? So um, here we are basically using limited data. So different colors are different the size of the data available to train such a path. And then we are showing the training loss as well as the training uh, error rate. So uh, so this is very intuitive in the sense that um, if you have less if you have less training data, um, the the loss uh, and then the error rate may be higher with uh, when you when you go uh, along the curve. But as long as you have uh, sufficiently many uh, training data, it's basically the training loss wouldn't be too much different uh, from the end models. So the, mo the more interesting thing is to look at uh, the backdoor effectiveness, right? So, um, so here is the plot. So remember the two endpoints are models with backdoors, right? So these dashed lines are the backdoor attack accuracy. So, uh, sorry, the backdoor attack error. So zero means the backdoors are completely effective. So what we can find is that if we uh, look at the models that are kind of a little bit away from the two end models, right? So there's a wide region uh, such that the, uh, the models will have will have similar performance in terms of standard accuracy to the two end model. But at the same time, uh, the back doors completely fail. Right, the attack error will go up to one hundred percent. Right, so that basically means we can search uh, only need to search along that path um, to find a good model uh, that has similar performance to the uh, end model. But at the same time, we can get rid of this uh, back door uh, effect. So we also compare it to other baselines, right? To see how our method works compared to others, right? So I just want to give you some highlights, right? So of course, one option to get rid of this backdoor uh, effect is always to train from scratch, right? Just don't use the pre-trained model at all, right? But uh, in this case, if you consider you only have limited data, you will have a very low accuracy. So it's not uh, of a practical interest. Um, and on the other hand, you can also try methods like pruning, right? But pruning will still give you high accuracy, but at the same time, the, you wouldn't be able to get rid of the backdoor effect. The other uh, common practice is to use uh, fine tuning, right? So you can take the, the pre trained model and fine tune on the clean data. But if your data size is truly limited, right, this fine tuning will not outperform uh, this uh, mode connection based approach, right? Because mode connection uh, kind of gives you a, a guarantee that. Uh, uh, as long as, as if you search on the, on the, on the path, then the, the, the standard accuracy wouldn't change too much. So it's actually a very, very ideal scenario when you only have limited data to uh, mitigate um, backdoors of uh, large uh, deep neural networks. So we also tried uh, some um, um, adaptive attack, right? In the sense that if the, if the attacker knows uh, as, a, as a defender, you are going to use this uh, path connection to, um, to, to, to mitigate my attack, right? Can I, instead of just a, a poison two, two models, can I poison the whole path, right? So no matter how you sample on the path, it will be a poison model. Uh, so, uh, so, but the, 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 then we, it's a blessing that we found out that as long as you, as a user, you have a clean and small trusted data that is not uh, seen to the uh, attacker, right? So you can actually find another alternative path that can uh, find a, a, a good and sanitized model uh, to mitigate such a backdoor uh, attack. 
so then, then you may ask how do you select a, a proper model index right to return uh, to to this uh, model owner right? so there are many practical approaches so for example if you get to observe the test accuracy you can use that as a threshold to determine what model you want to return uh, from the path uh, to the user or you can just simply use a k4 cross validation uh, on the trusted data um, to um, to to determine what model to be returned uh, as a sanitized model and in the paper we also discussed like what happens if you only have one uh, poison model right? how do you create two endpoints such that you can do this uh, path connection thing um, so, so you, there are some discussions in, in our papers too okay so questions before i move to the next uh, topic yeah, so I see Elia has a question. Is the performance here an artifact of the trigger used? Um, no, so I, th I think we actually tried different triggers. So we don't see any reason that the trigger will affect the history. So, so, it's, it, so it, it, it's really more like uh, the triggers are effective uh, nearby the points. It, it, it is poison on, right? So if you move, if you have the ability to move further away from those uh, Poisons, poisonous region, there's no reason that the trigger should still be effective for a model that is very further away from the poison point. And our method is completely agnostic to the trigger pattern because we, we do not assume we know what the models, the trigger patterns are. Okay. It seems like you answered the question, Ilya says, thanks. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to kind of switch gears and talk to you about the very interesting application that I've been uh, working on in the past uh, few uh, months. It's called the reprogramming. And it's uh, actually, I, I believe, inspired by its backdoor uh, attacks. So let's look at uh, first how transfer learning uh, performs in, in, in first place. Right? So usually you, you have, a, when you do transfer learning, you will have a source model that's pre-trained on some general task, right? like image net, and then uh, you are going to fine tune your model on your specific task. Right? Let's say you are I'm going to fine tune an image the model to classify dog versus cat. And in this case, what people do is okay, they will fine tune either the, the every layer or just some layers, right, to uh, to to classify this specific uh, dog and cat they have set. Uh, but the, the question that we are thinking about is uh, if, if it is true that the better source model will give you a better representation learning and hence a better transfer learning capability, right? So usually the best model, right, that we are available is actually a black box model, right? So these are like commercial models or those are models trained on massive resources and uh, does, does not want to uh, uh, release their whole uh, model parameter. So we have seen scenarios like that. So in this case, how do we do transfer learning with such a black box model? Right? So that's assuming we can access and inference the black box model field, but we are not allowed to know what are the actual parameters. Can we do any, any transfer learning with that uh, uh, black box model? So this becomes uh, this interesting black box adversarial reprogramming uh, um, uh, scenario. Right? So we basically try to reprogram a powerful but the black box models for transfer learning. And basically, so no fine tuning is possible because we don't know the model architecture and we don't know the model weights. Um, and, and we found it, it's a very effective method to do this cross domain uh, transfer learning in a data limited region. Right? So, uh, this is what I described as a black box model, right? So you are allowed to give any data input and observe the output, right? Like just like API uh, function, but you are not able to see what's inside that black box model. And the, the, the tasks that we are interested in here is like some medical imaging tasks, right? So these are like uh, label limited and uh, very expensive to acquire new, new uh, annotations scenarios. So how do we do this uh, reprogram of a uh, black box model to enable transfer learning? Right? So there are several stages. So uh, first, we are taking those uh, target domains and under and that those target target domain data undergo some input transformations. Right? So these input transformations are parameterized by a function uh, by a parameter w. So so it, it, this basically describes how we do it. Right? So we first uh, put those uh, target domain at the center of the source uh, input the size, right? And then we make those uh, frames, right? These noisy pixels as uh, some trainable parameters. And those frames are universal to every target domain data, right? So 
Uh, and then we, we put these uh, reprogram input to the bra box model. And then we will observe the predictions in terms of the source uh, labels, right? So you, in, in, in for the output, you need to do some multi-label uh, mapping in the sense that I'm going to uh, map the, the labels of pinch, goldfish, and hammer to ASD, the autism spectrum disorder, and also map uh, the other labels that to uh, non-ASD, right? So that basically uh, constitute the forward path. Uh, so we, and also I need to train such an input transformation um, such that um, uh, the, I, I, the, the, this black box model can learn how to solve my target task by through learning only the input transformation function. So in a way, it's uh, very uh, similar to these factors, right? Because you are adding some uh, backdoor trigger pattern that is universal to every data sample and try to manipulate output such that um, uh, it, it can output a specific function as you desire. Yeah, so here are like more details about how we do it, right? So you first take the target data, like TI, right? And then you basically pad it, pad it make, make some neural padding to it, enlarge it and make it the, the size compatible to the source model inputs. And then you add a universal perturbation P, right? So you can really think of this P as a nothing but a trigger pattern, but this trigger is now the, the frame uh, that, that uh, captures, that basically embeds the, the whole target data. So we, we are basically training this uh, trigger pattern to learn to solve the target task. And you can, when you do this uh, back propagation, right, because this is a black box model, uh, you, you can use uh, some techniques very similar to black box attack, right? like uh, this is zero order organization techniques to use uh, function values and finite differences to update those uh, um, uh, input transformation parameters to learn how to solve the target target task. And for the outputs, you can also do this multi-label mapping, right? So we basically say, okay, whatever the, the confidence scores are for tanks and goldfish and hammerhead, I'm going to average them and, and make them the confidence of uh, my target label, in this case, the autism spectrum disorder. So that's how you can uh, reprogram a black box function by basically adding an input transformation and with uh, assigned label mapping to uh, try to let the, this uh, source model to be reprogrammed and to learn new job. Um, so you can, uh, and then once you have this pipeline ready, you can now maximize uh, or optimize the training loss for the target task, right? Because now we have the label mapping already in place and you have set the input transformation to a learnable function. So all you need to know, all you need to do is you, uh, to learn to solve these uh, parameters, input parameters for input transformation to uh, enable this uh, um, black box adversarial training. And that would be very uh, standard technique, uh, just as a regular um, stochastic gradient descent, for example. So uh, with, with that, you will be very surprised how well it performs, right? So here we are. Uh, doing this autism spectrum disorder classification. And we are reprogramming uh, like a, a image name pre-trained models as our source models. So you can see that either rest net or inceptions is actually already attains a even better accuracy than state of the art. Right? And this state of the art are using uh, more complicated methods, a lot of feature engineering and a lot of uh, um, data augmentation. Uh, but still, by use, using this simple image net uh, um, reprogramming and that the, the source model to to extract those features uh, uh, automatically instead of uh, designing uh, uh, hand hand design features is actually giving us even better performance than state of the art. Um, we we also actually reprogram this real life uh, prediction API. So these are those APIs that we have no idea what are the models behind those APIs, right? So we reprogrammed the two uh, APIs uh, given by this uh, clarify.com, right? not so safe for work, also moderation API. And in this case, we see a very similar story, right? So you can only pay like $20 or so and, uh, and, and, and reprogram their model to do this autism special disorder detection with a relatively good uh, accuracy. And similarly, we also try this the auto AI function for uh, Microsoft uh, um, custom uh, vision API. Right? So you basically upload a data uh, and then the, 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 the API will train a model for you, but you, it will not tell you what is the model is. And then we, but we can still reprogram the API uh, and, and make it solve the autism spectrum disorder problems with just the $20. 
Okay, so now I'm going to do, make a conclusion and uh, mention some ongoing works, right? So um, in, in today's talk, I, I basically talk about uh, some practical and advanced backdoor attacks and defenses that happen in standard as well as federated learning systems. So I, I hope you all agree uh, it's, a, it's, a real, it's, it's a real threat and real issue, and we should spend uh, more efforts to, to address those issues. Uh, and then I kind of uh, use uh, backdoor attacks and motivation to talk about the uh, model reprogramming. Uh, which is, uh, I think, it's a very interesting way um, to do this uh, cost-effective transfer learning uh, with the mach machine learning systems. Um, there are some papers I don't have time to cover, but it's actually very related to what we described uh, uh, today. Right? So when you are learning these uh, more connections, there is actually some issues known as the ambiguity of the uh, neural network uh, parameters, because neural networks are basically uh, can be can, should, should be made permutationally in, invariant. Right? So we basically take these permutation ideas into consideration and use some neural alignment techniques um, to uh, come up with a better uh, mode connection methods. And that could uh, further improve uh, the, the, the search for a more robust and accurate models uh, when you search along the uh, path you found. Uh, and then in a recent AAAI paper, we actually kind of dive into how data heterogeneity in federated learning um, uh, 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 will, will, will affect the backdoor effect uh, um, and, and also in what sense, right? So you, the, you may, you may, there are different views, right? So you may think, that, okay, if we have data heterogeneity in some local agents, then the attackers has a more room to hide and has less likely to detect. Um, but at the same time, if you have a, a, too many data heterogeneity, then you, uh, the federated learning model is more difficult to train. And, Hence, those uh, uh, adversarial agents are more uh, easily to uh, reveal themselves and being detected. So it's very interesting to see how data heterogeneity affects uh, robustness of federated learning. Uh, and finally, um, for this reprogramming works, uh, we also have a recent uh, workshop paper talk of talking about how can we reprogram a language model uh, for molecular learning representations. Uh, if you're interested in, in uh, our works, you know, feel free to follow me on, on Twitter. I will share our uh, recent results uh, regularly. Um, and for those of you who are interested in entering these fields, right? So I, there are some sample surveys that I think is quite useful, right? Uh, to, to, to kind of uh, get uh, into this space and understand how do we evaluate attack and, and also how do we evaluate defenses and so on. Uh, there are also some online resources available, um, including my own uh, tutorial that was made online. So you know, feel free to uh, uh, check it out. And I also want to spend some time to talk about art. Right? So this is the uh, open source library uh, released by IBM. Uh, it's called the Adversal Robustness Toolbox. So we, uh, so it's very different to these uh, nice uh, clever hands uh, tools that uh, Nicola developed. Right? So here we, we try to uh, make this uh, uh, toolbox as independent as possible to any uh, deep learning platforms, right? So uh, we basically create, spend a lot of time to create the wrappers to wrap up, uh, to provide, uh, to support different uh, deep learning fun, uh, platforms like PyTorch, like TensorFlow. And also we, we, tend, we are also uh, expanding the support to allow uh, for non-deep learning models, right? like uh, um, it's a, it's a, a cyclic learn models, for example. And it also has a lot of attacks, defenses, and detection uh, evaluation methods in place. Um, lastly, I just want to mention, um, so this trusty AI is something that IBM values a lot about, right? So robustness is just one dimension of it. So in our group, we also focus on fairness, explainability, and transparency, uh, just to, to all together to bring uh, trust to uh, our AI uh, technology and services. Uh, and finally, I just want to do a quick advertisement. So we are organizing the, the third workshop on adversarial learning methods for machine learning and data mining at KDD. So it will be a virtual workshop. Uh, and we are sponsored by MIT, IBM, Watson AI Lab. So they will be sponsoring one best paper award and two rising star awards uh, at this event. Um, so you know, if, if you are interested, uh, you know, feel free to uh, submit your works there and we can have some discussion about uh, the, the future of adversarial learning methods. Uh, with that, I will conclude my talk. Thank you. Thanks, Pinyu, for the terrific talk. Uh, this I, I had a question if you if you have a couple minutes on yes, sure. the yes. last piece of work that you presented. Right. How do you parameterize the mapping basically that you 
prepend to the model. So I guess the okay, adversarial yeah. program. So, so the, the only the only learnable function is this uh, uh, w here, right? So mm -hmm. and w is basically nothing but those of frames on on the on the reprogram input, right? So so the, basically you, you can you, you can use this equation to describe what I did. So this ti is basically the target domain beta, right? like this um, like brain image for mm -hmm. example. Right, so you basically center that brain image uh, to, to to the to, to here, and then you make all the other available pixels trainable from trainable parameters. Right, so so your your target. Oh, so, so this side. is a, I guess this is a linear mapping here W. Yes, yes, uh, but you have you have to make sure it's uh, you will output uh, the the it, it will it will satisfy some uh, data yeah. uh, feature constraint uh, just to make it between zero and one for you. Yeah, so you, you can you can make it more complicated by, for example, uh, at making it as a fine transformation or making it like as a, some few more layers mm -hmm. and small convolution. So we actually try that, but surprisingly, we don't we don't find any benefit to consider more complex uh, uh, input transformation other than additive transformation. Yeah, so this additive mm -hmm. term is uh, very mysterious. Like it works best in terms of uh, generalization, and so we yeah we are not too sure why yet. I guess it might be because the two domains already have to be close enough that you can sort of use the same model to, to uh, operate yeah, on but, them. But that it's actually more than that, right? So here we're actually doing a, a, a lot of this cross-domain uh, reprogramming, mm -hmm. say, right? So in, in our recent paper, which is also under review, we actually have some theories proving that uh, this uh, reprogramming has nothing to do with this uh, knowledge transfer, right? It's, it's actually try, just try to align the representations learned from the source uh, mm -hmm. versus the target data, right? So with this, so you can think of if we have, if we have a good uh, P such that when you add P to the target data, the representations will be uh, very similar to the source data at the output. Right? And that basically means uh, um, you, you can achieve similar accuracy for the target task compared to the source task, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so we ha and we have some theories to show that is true, right? So it's basically saying all you all you care about reprogramming is uh, the the ability to align the target representation to be similar to the source representation. It's not really about the uh, knowledge transfer. At, at least the knowledge transfer does not show uh, show uh, 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 any effect in our the in the uh, the, the theory we we develop. So, but I, so that's why I think it's very interesting to. Yeah, to 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 kind of uh, give uh, more thoughts about these reprogramming techniques. So there are two questions mm -hmm. left. I guess the first one was regarding distributed backdoors. Did you try any defenses like Cronus? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we do try Chrome, right? But uh, so Chrome is uh, is I think it's a uh, it's some preferable defense against uh, these Byzantine attacks, right? But here we are not really doing Byzantine attacks. We are doing backdoors. So. In our paper, we do try Chrome, and you can see um, com comparing to centralized backdoor attack, right? This, this I think it's yeah. attack more effective uh, against the Chrome. Okay, and and the other question is, what kind of uses for reprogramming in the industry? I guess that's a very open-ended question. Yeah, yeah. So I yeah, so I I, I wouldn't know how we will make it. Um, uh, useful, but for me, I'm very excited because I think it's, this is really a new way to do transfer learning, right? Especially you only have limited data, right? So, I, I think we we as a machine learning researcher, we all agree that if there is a good model that can solve all tasks, right? Then we, we should focus on that model and then just uh, fine tune on the features learned from that model to different tasks, right? That's why people are so excited about you Novi know, transformers and uh, this meta learning because you know we we we. Finally, can get rid of this. Okay, one model per task scenario. Mm -hmm. We can go. We have the one model for all task scenario, right? So, and to me, uh, uh, I, I'm now thinking. Okay, so can we do this uh, downstream uh, learning, right, or downstream fine tuning more efficient, right? And so, if, if when you have the when you encounter this limited uh, data for the, the target task, I think this uh, you, you should definitely consider reprogramming because uh, it is definitely a very a, a stronger baseline and. Uh, it, it, it also it has less parameters to train uh, compared to this uh, uh, full fine-tuned uh, right. transfer learning. Yeah, so I think there's some, some advantages, um, and also this uh, cross-domain learning capability is also very exciting. Yeah, so I, I, I now I, I try to 
um, I, 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 I will hope reprogramming can um, kind of prevent people from reinventing the wheels, but rather than using the wheels in a more clever way to uh, to 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 invent a, a airplane, for example. <laughs> That's my yeah. hope. Awesome. Well, thanks again so much. I think we're just on time. Uh, this this was a great talk, and I, I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much for remotely visiting us. Peter. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. I hope you're all staying, staying uh, well and healthy. <laughs> likewise, <laughs> likewise. And thanks, everybody, for the Thank questions on, on the chat. Thank you. Very nice talking to you. Take care. Take care. Bye.